Chris Sewell here, baseball card collector, investor, dealer in that order. Welcome everyone, question and answer time today. I uh, split this up into two videos. This here is uh, part one, part two will be a week from today. First question is from Farenthrope. He wrote, what vintage pre-1981 non-Hall of Famers do you consider to be the most important players in the card hobby? Some players never made the Hall of Fame, but are still quite important in baseball history. Obviously, Pete Rose would be somewhere near the top. I've been collecting Kurt Flood cards and was actually really happy when Richie Allen made it to the Hall of Fame. Any others you'd like to share? Uh, it's a fun question to start things off. Uh, just to correct you, Richie Allen actually did not make the Hall of Fame yet. He fell just short in the, the last time he was eligible. I, I suspect he'll He'll get in. I actually made that mistake as well in one of my videos at one point. I thought he had gotten in as well, but now he, he uh, fell just short. But the three names that jump out to me to answer your question are uh, Pete Rose, Roger Maris, and Thurman Munson. All, all three of those guys are, their card prices are as if they're Hall of Famers and not just like low, like high end Hall of Famers or, or at least mid level Hall of Famers. Um, there's a bunch of others. Uh, Kurt Flood's a good one. Richie Allen is definitely a good one. Tommy John. I, I, I would suspect Tommy John and Richie Allen will eventually get into the Hall of Fame. Uh, but yeah, those are those are the names that sort of jump out at first uh, first first thought. This question was sent in by Dave. Who I pulled a 2022 Topps Chrome Blue Ray Wave rookie autograph of Julio Rodriguez, uh, numbered at a 150. I'm debating on two things: should I get it graded, and should I sell the card or leave it in my PC? So congratulations on that pull. Obviously, a really nice uh, pull there. To answer your questions, I mean th these are really sort of personal questions that uh, I can't answer for you. I mean, it's really really up to you. Do you want to get the card graded or not? Both answers are perfectly fine. It's it's what, what you want to get out of the card, you know, what you value about the card and what your plans are for it. If you're asking me purely from like a financial standpoint, like you plan on selling it, then, you know, I would say if the card's really, really sharp and has no issues, then yeah, it's probably going to make sense to grade it first and then sell it. You'll probably make more money that way. But uh, again, it's up to you. And, and same thing with you want to keep it in your PC or if you want to sell it, uh, completely up to you. Both, both answers make perfect sense, you know. If you're asking me, is it a card that I would personally PC? The answer is no, but that's not what anybody should base their own PC on. They should base their own PC on what, what they want. And, uh, you know, keeping the card in your PC makes perfect sense. Selling it, it makes perfect sense. Depends on if you like the card or if you would, you'd rather have the money. It's really up for uh, for you to decide. Next was sent by Card Collector Kyle, who wrote, Just curious if you can go over the rarest 1989 Fleer, uh, I think you mean Billy Ripken, uh, Rick Face variations and why they're so fluctuated in, in price. As I picked up a 1989 error a few months ago, but didn't know about all the different variations. So there's actually five different variations according to Beckett, or five official variations, we'll say. Uh, there's the uh, three that I would say are, are quite common, and then two that are quite rare. The uh, common one are just the standard error, the uh, the scribble out where they sort of try to scribble out the error, and then they, uh, the black box is the most common where they just put a black box over the bat knob. And then the two that are quite rare are the white scribble out where they, they scribbled it out in white and then the white box where they just put a white box over the uh, the bat knob. You know, they're all, they all have different values and it's all just based on how rare they are. The, the rare ones are more valuable, the, the less rare ones are less valuable. The one exception might be the uh, the actual error itself is, is probably more valuable than uh, than it would otherwise be because, well, it's the it's the one that shows the, uh, the actual error. But there's also a bunch of other variations that aren't, uh, you know, officially recognized by by Beckett and other companies. There's like a saw cut variation where I, the story, as I understand it, is the factory was going to throw all these out and just had a saw cut through the cards and then they were going to just toss them in the trash. But somebody took a bunch of them. I, I don't know if that's the correct story or if that's actually what happened. But and then there's other sort of really really minor variations here and there based on a whole bunch of things printing on the card. But they're not they're not like recognized as official variations. But uh, yeah, those are the the many variations of the famous Billy Ripken error card. Next one was sent by Sean who wrote, I tried to help the seller avoid a return or dispute by clarifying that a card they listed was not a 1953, but actually a 1991 archives. Does putting as is in the title exempt them from responsibility for not listing 1991 or archives in the uh, title description? When they sent me a picture of the back, it is clearly marked with archives, but they omitted the back photo from the listing. Uh, so I, I don't know eBay's policy in this particular case. I mean, you know, the seller clear does not accept returns here, but you're always allowed to return something via eBay if something is not listed as described. So I don't know if eBay would consider this not listed as described or not. My guess is that they, they would consider it not listed as described and would, would force the seller to take a return. But regardless, to me, the answer to your question is a clear no. This is not, you can't just list a card wrong and then put as is and then say, well, I put as is, so... I'm in the clear, so in, in my opinion, uh, no, the, the, the seller is not in the clear here. 
Next one sent in by Simon 466 cards who wrote, it would be great to see videos going through the different cards for individual stars from the vintage era with your knowledge of the hobby. For example, you could do a whole video on all the different Babe Ruth and J Jackie Robinson cards that exist. I think people would really appreciate learning more about the history of the hobby while we wait for you to finish building that time machine. So just to be clear, I'm not actually building the time machine myself. I, I ordered it. I uh, ordered about two years ago at this point. Uh, there must be some crazy backlog because it still has not arrived. I should probably send a, uh, a follow-up email at this point. But I like your idea a lot with a vintage player, you know, a video about individual vintage players and all their cards. You know, I will say whenever I post vintage-specific content on the channel, it gets very, very few views, which, you know, is a little disappointing. I'd probably prefer to do more vintage content than I do, but... Uh, and not that number of views is the only thing that matters, but uh, you know I do I do pay attention to that. I want I want to be posting stuff that a lot of people enjoy. So, uh, but regardless, I, I like your idea a lot. Something I'll I'll definitely consider. This was sent by Andrew, who wrote, "I like so many people have had frustrations with PSA submissions. I have studied my graded cards and compared them through a 10x loop. I'm quite confident in my ability to judge corners and centering. However, edges remain a mystery. I mostly collect and submit older cards." I believe that near mint and mint cards of this vintage are not supposed to have perfectly sharp edges because of the cut-in methods used of the era. I have read that if you see an older card with an edge like a modern card, it has likely been trimmed. I have been assured that PSA and other grading companies take this into consideration when grading, but I have had a hard time telling what is good enough edge for a vintage card to receive a high grade. Uh, I'm curious if you can shed, uh, shed some light on this dark art of judging vintage edges. So unfortunately, I don't think I have much of a really good answer here for you. You know, I agree with you that sometimes on vintage cards, there'll be like a super sharp edge and that edge looks like a, you know, a modern card right out of a pack. And, and sometimes that can mean the card is trimmed there. And that's definitely something to be aware of, but not always. I mean, I've, I've definitely seen vintage cards with crazy sharp edges all around that I was quite sure was good. So, you know, that's not like a foregone conclusion you can make, but it's definitely something to be to be aware of. In terms of how do I grade edges, I don't know that I could, you know, explain it really in any sort of meaningful way. And how does PSA grade edges? I definitely couldn't explain. I have, I have no idea how they grade edges. Uh, but you know, with grading, it, I really think it's all just a function of experience. Like the more cards you've graded, the more it makes sense. The more, the easier it becomes to predict grades. The better you get at it, and and that's that's sort of all there is. I don't think there's any sort of shortcut to that. So. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I really think that's sort of the only answer, and I don't, I don't know that there's another answer beyond that. This was sent by Joe, who wrote, "Why were vending boxes called vending boxes? When did Tops make them? How uh, were they distributed and purchased?" So I don't, I don't know all the details, but vending boxes were designed for vending machines. You used to be able to buy baseball cards in vending machines. Uh, here, here's a picture of one from 1976, and the vending boxes held, you know, 500 cards or whatever, and and you would. It was designed so you could push the cards directly into the vending machine in one motion, and it was designed specifically for that, and that's why they're called uh, vending boxes. Uh, I don't know who it was distributed to. I, I imagine it was distributed to companies that owned, you know, vending machines and, and specifically wanted it for this purpose. Uh, I don't I don't know when they started and stopped. It, they definitely existed in the 70s and in the 80s and through the end of the 80s, so I would... I would guess that they started in the 60s, but it, it could have been in the 50s. I'm not, I'm not sure how far that goes back. Definitely definitely in the 70s and the 80s, and it probably stopped somewhere around 1990. Although, that, again, I don't know that one for sure either. This question was sent by Dave, who wrote, I had a question about graded cards and slabs versus raw cards that a dealer or seller grades as poor, good, etc. Assuming you can trust the dealer, such as Greg Morris, is it fair to say a very good raw uh, grade truly equates to a PSA 3? and an excellent to a PSA 5, et cetera, as far as the condition of the card. If so, how would you compare the sale price of the two? Obviously, raw should cost you less, but is there any rough guide to how much less? Do you think this rule changes for the lowest condition card? For example, I often think I could get the, the same card for a lower price if it was graded as a PSA 1 instead of being a raw card that looks like it would grade a 1 or 2. Uh, some interesting questions here. It requires a little bit of nuance, but, you know, if... Greg Morris calls a card EX. Does that definitely mean it's going to grade a PSA five? Uh, no, certainly, certainly not. You know, at Greg Morris, there's just a person giving their opinion on the grade of the card, and at PSA, there's just a person giving their opinion on the grade of the card. That that's all. That's all that's going on. You know, there's just two human beings in their and their opinion. Even experts are going to disagree sometimes on the grade of the card, and some companies are stricter than others. Some companies have different grading standards than others. There's no like one rule and true answer to the grade of any one card so so no now a company like greg morris has a great reputation and the reason they have a great reputation is all the time or you know the vast majority of time they grade a card experts all agree that the grade they've assigned is is a fair grade and, and that's why they've built it so 
but that doesn't mean it's going to line up exactly to what uh, to what PSA thinks. Um, for your second question, is there sort of like a formula between the value of the card raw versus uh, graded? Definitely not. That varies heavily card to card. Uh, I would say there's more variance at the high end than at the low end, but there's certainly no formula that, that you can use. You really have to look at that on a case by case basis. And and your last point's kind of an interesting one. Yeah, if you if you sometimes I, I don't I don't know it makes sense to me. Sometimes you might be able to get a PSA one uh, cheaper than you can get a low grade raw card if uh, if that's the way you want to approach it. So uh, I like that idea. Chris asks, can you discuss error cards and knowing if you have them? So I couldn't, you know, possibly go through every error card in a short video here, but a couple of things I'll say about errors. One is there, there's very, very, very few errors in the hobby that, that matter. And I mean, like, I don't know, 20 ever. And off the top of my head, I can maybe come up with 10. The vast majority of errors nobody cares about. You know, errors isn't something that people are really collecting much today. Uh, and you'll see all sorts of manipulated error stuff on eBay, you know, this card is a rare error because it has two dots on the back instead of one, or it has a, a, a line here it's not supposed to be. And a lot of this stuff is just misprint stuff, or you know, this guy, they listed his date of birth wrong, but the card was never corrected, so nobody cares. And you know, most errors like this just don't have any value. And I would say in general, errors just aren't something you need to concern yourself with. Now there are a few exceptions, very very few. Uh, like for example, one being the Billy Ripken from earlier in the video. And if you ever suspect you have maybe a rare error, I would go on eBay and and look at completed sales, sold items, not uh, listed items, sold items, see if you can find your variation of the uh, the error. Remember, for an error to have any value, it needs to have been corrected, and then the error needs to be the rare of the, the two versions. So see if you can find both versions and, and, and make sure that the one you have is the one that uh, has, has, has some notable sale prices, and uh, that's sort of how I would recommend researching it if you, if you suspect you have an error card. Dad Google account wrote, I've been contemplating starting a PC of iconic moments in sports on cards. What better way to connect to cards than to remember those moments? The value of the card would be irrelevant. The most recent one that comes to mind is Derrick Henry stiff arming Josh Norman. Not exactly iconic, but a great play that I watched over on replay a few times. Is there other examples on less valuable cards that you can think of? Is there a card of the catch or a card of the immaculate reception? Uh, that is such a cool idea for a PC. I, I, I love it. Uh, I don't know that there's a card of the catch, Dwight Clark's, uh, Dwight Clark's catch or, or Franco Harris's immaculate reception during their playing days. There probably is, you know, more modern stuff that's kind of a look back type thing, but I don't think during their playing days. But there's lots of gr lots of great ones. Uh, off the top of my head, there's the Odell Beckham catch on a 2015 Topps card. That's probably the most impressive catch I've ever seen. There's lots in baseball. Uh, you can do the Kirk Gibson home run from his 1989 upper deck card. Uh, you can go to the Bill Mazurowski uh, home run from his 1961 Topps. Uh, these are both, you know, all-time great moments in baseball history. Uh, Tops Now has really grown on me. I was not really a huge fan of Tops Now when they first came out, but they, they've grown on me. I think they're they're pretty cool now. They do a lot of, I mean, that's a lot of what they do is just like the moments, capturing the moments of baseball and putting them on a card. So you could you could go that route. I don't know if you're looking for just footballs. That's all you mentioned in your uh, in your in your email. But yeah, there's lots of great ones out there. Uh, yeah, really really cool idea for a PC. This was sent out by Jason. When I buy a pack or a box of cards, I buy two. One to open as a collector and one to save as a future investment. Do you think buying and keeping unopened boxes or packs is a good investment 10 to 15 years down the road? Or do they lose value looking historically? Ah, that's an interesting way to do it. I don't want to say that's that's fun, you know, more than, more than an investment. Like you can save those packs for a rainy day. You know, in the past, I might have said, um, you know, I think in the past, historically, unopened product has been a good long-term investment. Uh, generally, not not always, but generally. However, there's a notable exception to that, and that is the junk wax era. Junk wax era stuff was so mass produced, a lot of people were hoarding it, and there's just tons of it today, and it it's, it's, hasn't gone up in value in 30 years at all. It may have even gone down in value in, in many cases. And a lot of people feel like we're in a new junk wax era. There's so much product, it's so much overproduction. Uh, so, you know, you could probably say historically, if you were to compare this to the junk wax era, Maybe that's not the best uh, investment, uh, you know, strategy. Now, who knows? Anything can happen. But I would probably sort of lean that way in terms of ultra modern product. Benjamin wrote, "I recently gotten interested in the Topps Venezuela cards from the late '50s and '60s. The Venezuela looks uh, ones look identical to the U.S. versions, at least to me. Is there an easy way to identify them?" I I love the uh, Venezuelans, although they, they can be really tough to uh, figure out. It, it takes some uh, some getting used to for sure. A couple of problems is. They skipped around years, you know, they weren't producing cards every year, so they were skipping around years, and they weren't consistent in 
sort of what they were doing, which why it makes uh, it so tough. To go through year by year, in 1959, that one's fairly easy. Uh, the cards look identical in almost all the years, but in 1959, at least they say printed in Venezuela on the back. So that's uh, sort of the obvious tell. 1960, I think, is the hardest. There's, It's really hard to tell. Uh, if you're looking at photos, you basically can't tell. They're essentially identical on the front and the back. Now, if you're holding a card in hand, and this is the case with all the years, you can tell the card stock's a little cruder and uh, sort of, I don't know, lower quality maybe. And it, it's a little, you can tell if you're holding one of each. But uh, from a picture, it's really, really hard to tell. 62 is a little easier as the back shows uh, everything in both English and Spanish as opposed to just English, so that's sort of obvious. 64 is pretty easy. Again, the back is black instead of the standard orange. The, the Venezuelas are the black. Uh, 66 is a really, really tough one as well. Uh, the, they're, they're identical in all ways except that, again, the cardstock is different and the shade on the back is a little bit different. In this case, the Venezuela is on the left. And then 67 is pretty obvious. The cards are have a little bit smaller. They have much smaller borders, and then the backs are completely different. So uh, that's the way to identify them. Uh, those are these. I think I got all the years there. I might have missed one. Rudy asked, wondering your thoughts on golf cards. Is the 1981 Donruss set the first mainstream set? I personally think the 81 uh, Jack Nicklaus is a great investment now. Would love your opinion. So I don't know a whole lot about golf cards. As I understand it, the 1981 Donruss is the first sort of mainstream golf set. So in terms of long-term investment, so that that sort of works in a favor. But it, it was very mass-produced, uh, sort of in the '80s. So uh, you know that sort of works against it. It's not not a particularly rare set. Now, it does have the Jack Nicholas, uh, you know, one of the goats in the sport. So that's that's significant. And you know, if you're asking about that specific card, I don't know that I would have a strong opinion either way. It seems seems reasonable to me as a potential long-term investment card, but also not one that would be near the uh, the top of my list or anything like that. Next one is sent by Jim, who wrote, Understanding that collecting is personal, when it comes to investing, is it really worthwhile buying any cards post-2000? Seems every year there are 25 to 50 rookie cards, variations, brands, etc. of every player. They try to promote scarcity via numbered cards, but I don't buy it. Uh, it's a really great question. Actually, this would make a, a good video. Maybe I'll make a video about this uh, question at some point. But uh, in short, it sort of depends on what you mean by investing. I mean, if you're talking about like short term, like a year or even a few years, yeah, there's some modern cards that can can do well there uh, or can be good candidates for that. But if you're talking about like long-term investing, uh, you know, I want to buy this card, keep it in my PC for 10, 20 years and expect it to be worth a whole lot more in the future. You know, modern's probably not not the way to go or that wouldn't be my prediction as the way to go for for the most part, especially not ultra modern. Like you said, there's a lot of, you know, cards today and it's numbered out of 25, but in, and it seems rare, but in reality there's hundreds of cards of that player from that year numbered out of 25 and they can all sort of be clumped together they're all sort of interchangeable with each other so they're, they're not actually rare it's sort of a it's a manufactured rareness to them if you will uh card you know post 2000 yeah there's definitely cards from post 2000 i would say are, are decent long-term investment potential cards um you know all uh, hall of fame rookies all-time great players they're key rookies in, in high grade that sort of uh you know, there's plenty of that post 2000, but ultra modern, I don't see much. And, you know, the vast majority of my long-term investment portfolio is, is uh, vintage. But that's it for round one. Thank you everyone for submitting questions. And if anyone feels I didn't answer your question in full, feel free to leave a comment and I'll uh, follow up there. But round two will be a week from today and uh, see you all again then. Thanks everyone.